to Lulu Matute, who in fact is working with School of the Americas Watch. She's now out in the Silicon Valley based Central America uh, Caribbean Scholar Activist Network. And she's doing a lot of advocating work for legislative support to address the root causes of migration, which of course is the big issue that faces us um, in the entire North and South America hemispheres at this point in time. She also is a desert aid EMT working alongside No More Deaths, providing emergency medical and humanitarian assistance to people in the deserts. Uh, she has particular interest and expertise in relation to Honduras, which is going to be a major focus of what she shares with us today. Since it's impossible to look at in detail at every Central American country, and there are particular human rights issues around Honduras, it is a and the School of the Americas, it's a good place to turn. Uh, Lulu, let's move on to you and take a closer look at some of the issues going on with Honduras in particular. Thank you, Sunny. Uh, thank you, Inga. Um, you, you said something in your book that really stood out to me, very many things, but one of them was as U.S. Americans, uh, we have the privilege um, of forgetting about these countries. We don't, it's, it's just not, it doesn't have to be there. It doesn't have to be part of uh, memory and psyche. Um, but to the people who are directly impacted, to their descendants, their families, the communities that are displaced and ripped apart, um, it's something you can't forget. It's something you can't stop thinking about. Um, for the activists, uh, the scholars, the researchers who are deep into this work, it's something you can't forget because the injustices are so clear. Um, the historical connections there are so clear. Um, now, in, uh, in Hillary Clinton's uh, memoir, it, a peculiar thing happened where she too, conveniently enough, and her publisher too, conven conveniently enough, forgot um, about this part of the world. They forgot about, about Honduras and the military coup in the reprinting of the paperback version. It was in the hardcover version, the paperback version, which often sells more than hardcover, um, this was left out. Right, so again, we see a replication of forgetting, the convenience of forgetting about these histories. Um, and we can't look at Honduras without looking at US involvement in that country. Um, there are three very important moments in recent um, Honduran history that point to US intervention and, and how that has led to what we're seeing today. Massive exodus, mass migration out of Honduras. Uh, the displacement um, of people within the country um, and the violence against land defenders and folks uh, in the um, social justice movements. Uh, these three moments, um, I'll, I'll speak about them briefly, start my timer as well. Um, and you mentioned, I'll just add a, a little more uh, information to each one. Um, in the 80s, the height of the Cold War, um, we see the US administration under Reagan investing in stopping uh, this scary domino effect of communism coming to the US. Um, and the way the country decided to do that was to militarize and crush any, any movement um, that sounded, tasted, smelled anything near communism. Um, so all these movements that are happening in El Salvador, in Guatemala, in Nicaragua are seen through one, one lens, red scare, that's bad, we need to crush it. US starts investing in it. Um, Honduras at that point serves as a, a, a very strategic geopolitical outpost for U.S. interests. You're bordering with Nicaragua, with El Salvador, with Guatemala, and the Sotocano Air, Air Base is in Honduras, which allows these huge military planes to come in. Um, and this starts the ongoing, and we see it to this day, uh, investment in security forces in Honduras that are U.S. sponsored, U.S. trained, U.S. funded, and, and supported. Uh, so that's gone throughout. Uh, the next period and moment, uh, the 90s, we see this, this laying out uh, of what the Washington consensus is going to look like. And some of these things are, are um, economic models, economic checklists that have to happen um, to, to create space for Honduran development, uh, the idea of economic development in that country. Now we start seeing the restructuring 
of, of laws and policies, um, the privatization of public lands of uh, what was called state enterprises. Um, and this lays the groundwork uh, for, for the post-coup um, reality that Hondurans are facing with. Um, and what we see, uh, 2009 military coup, we see the ousting of Mel Celaya, a democratically elected president, was forced out of the country in his pajamas. And we have the, the, the um, um, uprising of, of a military coup. Um, we have a post-coup government and um, Pepe Lobo, uh, in 2010, um, we see the Honduras is open for business. Uh, and this banner is so blatant and so clear that at this point, um, post-military coup, um, the country was open and welcoming and willing to uh, support um, you, um, external investment in the country. Um, and, and we see this uh, with things uh, like the, the concessions that we're giving to companies over private over public land, over um, the enterprises. So we see the selling of rivers, of natural resources, um, and that happens post-coup. Now there are a few other things I, I would like to mention. Um, when you look at School of the Americas, uh, modern name WINSEC, um, we know that the US invested and continues to invest in, in Latin America as the logic of the backyard for protecting um, the, natural resources that can come from it is life or death for the people of Honduras. Um, according to the WINSEC website, um, they do share information on, on where uh, the trainees of the school are coming from. And we see that the majority today, um, Honduras and Colombia. Um, and, and we see that playing out both in Honduras and Colombia, um, the security forces that are there to repress uh, and to stop the social activism and social justice movements that are fighting for the protection of the land, of the rivers, um, and a perfect example of that would be um, the brutal assassination of uh, indigenous activist Berta Cáceres uh, for her activism in, in protecting um, and organizing for the protection of Rio Blanco and Indibuca. Um, that's one of the pieces. Um, now, the current administration is discussing how uh, to address the root causes of mass migration from Central America. And the solution is the very problem that activists, that folks on the ground have been ringing the alarm for years, right? The solution that this administration is looking at is economic development. This is the very issue that's creating the displacement. So the Biden administration is proposing $4 billion over four years to strengthen economic opportunities with the idea of addressing mass migration. Um, and again, this is alarming because uh, we, the people who are directly impacted, we, the folks who read this history, who understand it, um, we know that the imposition of these economic development projects, uh, what they actually look like, uh, and it leads to displacement. It leads to the clearing of land. And in the context of a settler colonial project, this we need to clear the land of the people, of the indigenous, ascended, the people who are on the land, we need to remove them fence it up, privatize it um, to be able to sell it. And that's what we're seeing. That's what the 80s, 90s, and the post-school regime made possible. Uh, it's clearing the land of people who are from the land. It's expelling um, indigenous, Afro-descendant, uh, Garifuna communities from the coast um, to be able to privatize these lands for tourism, um, for mining, for a bunch of different uh, extractivist projects that are also gonna be extracting wealth, both economic potential wealth um, and the natural wealth of the country outside of the country. Um, and again, and we're left with this continuation of the legacy of extractivism and expulsion in the country. Um, now, again, to reiterate, the actual root cause that this administration is overlooking because of the convenience of forgetting about these countries, about forgetting um, of, of this history of US intervention in Central America, um, they're looking to solve this issue of mass migration um, by contributing to the same problem. And again, that's the extractivist, violent uh, logic of economic um, development in the region and in Honduras in particular. Um, and it's important to, to note that though there are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people leaving uh, the region and in at the US-Mexico border, um, 
you'll meet a lot of Hondurans who are there, a lot of Central Americans, but there is an overrepresentation of Hondurans who are leaving. So it's really important to look at the country of Honduras and the relationship, historical and contemporary relationship between the US and Honduras. Um, and it's important to note that that partnership between Honduras and the US, at least in terms of security, right? Um, whether it's for narco trafficking, the war on drugs, um, at this point, it's, it's the war on migration and the war on poor peoples. Um, that continuation of the relationship between Honduras and, and the U.S. is still there, and it's being funded every day through military training, through military sponsorship, through the buying and purchasing of munitions that are also um, fired upon and against the people who are there to fight um, and protect the land from privatization. Um, I also want to uh, note that in Honduras, there is a sustained movement um, people who don't want to migrate, people who want to, they want to invest in a democracy. They want to create a country where they can live in, where they can flourish, where they can raise their children and crops. Um, but it is nearly impossible. That alone is a deadly business to go into activism. Um, political activists, land defenders, water protectors are not safe in a country where uh, the military is there protecting private interests at the expense of their lives, at the expense of their existence on that land. Um, a, a very important piece that came out of um, Honduras' open for business idea, the post-school regime, is, is the sedes. And I think this is a very alarming thing. The sedes are essentially um, model cities, startup cities. That's kind of how they're being um, pitched. Uh, they're zones for employment and economic development that are free of constitutional rule. Um, they, they just suspend uh, laws that would apply to the country, the people, um, to, to those in power. These are completely independent zones. So countries within countries um, that are able to have their own security forces, their own justice systems, um, all of it that is completely independent from the state, from any, um, any accountability, um, from the democratic rule um, and, and checks and balances of the people. And we know that in a corrupt country like Honduras, that's impossible. Democracy is a fallacy. It's a, it's a face, um, it's a performance that, that um, the current regime under Juan Orlando Hernandez uh, that they put on to protect uh, and continue receiving US funds. Um, and one of the big asks that we, we push for with, uh, with our partners in Honduras, with our partners like the Solidarity Collective, C-Space, School of the Americas Watch, um, communities, what we push for uh, is for the U.S. to suspend uh, this military aid to the country because the security aid, the military aid, is continuously being used against the people of Honduras who are there to organize, to fight for real democracy, to fight for the protection of the lands, uh, to fight for the right to exist uh, of indigenous and Afro-descendant communities uh, on that land. Um, so we do ring the alarm and we call on U.S. citizens, U.S. residents, U.S. organizers to speak, uh, to ask of their representatives to speak out on these issues, um, to divest um, from security funding, um, and also to, to think of what this ongoing uh, economic model of development that is truly extractive and violent uh, against the people, against the land, to rethink this um, as we think about solutions to mass migration, as we think of uh, solutions to the corruption in the country. It isn't to uh, invest in the problem more, but rather to be real, to look at the inconvenient history of US Honduran relations, uh, and come up with real solutions that can support the people on the ground, the people of the land who are fighting to exist so that they don't have to migrate. Thank you very much, Lulu. Uh, 